Today, we've gone in a little bit of a different direction and certainly a fun one for me as I've welcomed onto this episode two of my friends who I met in Anaheim recently at the uh, Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference. And we hit it off straight away because we realized we had a lot of parallels, not just in the way that we ate, but in the way that we serve people and help people online. So I'd like to welcome Robbie and Cyrus from Mastering Diabetes. How are you going, guys? Thank you so much, Plant. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's really great to be here. And uh, looking forward to sharing everything we can with your audience. Awesome. Well, some folks might be wondering, why are we, uh, why are we having some guests on to talk about diabetes on our podcast that typically focuses on inflammatory arthritis. And the reason is that we time and time again see people with inflammatory arthritis um, who sometimes have other health conditions. And one of those other health conditions that they sometimes have is either pre-diabetes or they're type 2 diabetic. And in some rare cases, they also are type 1. And what I found is that when they follow the Patterson program and they eat a whole foods, low-fat, plant-based diet, that these other conditions also improve, especially pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And so when I got talking with these, uh, these now friends of mine in Anaheim, we realized how effective this dietary approach can be against these conditions. And, uh, and that's why I want to explore this today. I want to talk about the differences between type 1, type 2. I want to hear the stories of Robbie and Cyrus and how they came about forming this wonderful, fast-growing organization. And for those of us with family members who have these conditions, uh, be able to send them off in the right direction towards your Mastering Diabetes online program and support. So why don't we kick off? Um, let's let's hear some stories. Uh, Robbie, tell us, uh, how did you come about? Uh, tell us about your health and how you came about into this uh, this sort of business and so forth. Sure. So I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 12 years old. So this was in 2000. And my older brother also has type 1 diabetes. So the difference between type 1 and type 2 is that uh, people living with type 1 diabetes, their pancreas has been damaged. So I don't produce insulin. I don't produce enough insulin. And I have to inject, inject exogenous insulin to live. So I've been doing that since, um, since I was 12. And over the years, I just learned and learned about new dietary approaches, how to improve, how to become, uh, you know, reduce my chances of complications, which is a big concern with anybody living with diabetes. And I mean, long story short, I ended up coming across the low fat plant-based whole food diet and it just transformed my life in every way imaginable. So my insulin sensitivity improved dramatically. I'm sure Cyrus is gonna talk about that in detail today why that's important. And, um, and my, but more important than that was for me, was my quality of life. And that's why I am just, you know, Cyrus and I both are so passionate about sharing this message because we are about more than just diabetes numbers. We're about overall health, quality of life. And anybody's watching the video, they can see the fruits and vegetables behind me. I love the food I eat. I enjoy it. I get to eat fruit. People with diabetes are told that's not okay. And so I've been living this lifestyle for 11 years now. And over 11 years, as a type 1 diabetic, I've never had an A1C above 6.6, usually in the, in the low fives or the high fives. And, but again, beyond just diabetes numbers, my quality of life is amazing. I, mean, I just got an email yesterday about somebody living with type 1. Like they, they quit. They left college. They stopped playing sports. And some people let it take over their life. And for Cyrus and myself and our clients, it's like, no, it's just a small inconvenience and we still get to live a super high quality life. So yeah, I've been eating this way for a long time. And uh, as far as career wise, I graduated from University of Florida with a degree in basically event management and a minor in business. And that uh, I met the founder and president of Forks Over Knives at a health event in Costa Rica. And then I worked there for six years and had a lot of fun sort of building that company up from scratch with him, sort of his right-hand person. And, uh, you know, Brian's a really good friend and just a genius, brilliant guy. What he's done with Forks and Eyes has just been amazing. So it was very fun for my, my time there with him. And then I just, you know, Cyrus and I started talking about what we could do together. And, and I left Forks and Eyes to create Mastering Diabetes with Cyrus because we felt there wasn't 
in the world of low fat plant based whole food nutrition, there wasn't one website, one destination where people could go to figure out exactly what to do if you're living with diabetes, all the nuanced details. So, our good friend Neil Barnard at PCRM, he has some great resources. We had some good of forks over knives, but there was not a place for all the nuanced details of what to do for people living with diabetes. And that's what we've created. We have a coaching program and we're really, really proud of it. Yeah, man, it, it, it's, it's sensational because you and I have spoken behind the scenes and Cyrus and we've talked about, you know, how many people you've been able to reach and the results that you've been able to get for people. And it is amazing. Um, just to frame it in my audience's mind, it's very similar to the Patterson program in that you can access materials online. There is a support platform. And so it's just a really, really comprehensive way to enable an enriched life for people with this condition. Um, so awesome, man. Love it. And love your work with Forks Over Knives. Obviously, that's just been a major success story. And uh, I always like hearing about that part of your life and, and learning more about that. Uh, so now, Cyrus, I want to shift over to you now. And, um, and Robbie touched upon um, some blood marker numbers. Uh, and maybe when, when you tell us your story and how you came about um, into this plant-based uh, uh, lifestyle as well. Uh, expect, if you could explain those numbers a little bit more for us and give us a, an idea of what we're aiming for when we've got diabetes and, and what our markers should be and what's, what's scary and so on. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. I'll tell my story and then I'll yeah. go into the number. Great, great. Okay, so uh, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in, the, in 2002. So normally people get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when they're young, when they're 4 years old, 8 years old, 12 years old. So it's considered a juvenile onset form of diabetes. And just like Robbie said, it results from an autoimmune destruction of a very specific set of cells in your pancreas that only makes up about 1% of the total pancreas mass. So your pancreas is a pretty big organ. And 99.9% .9 of your pancreas functions fine, but there's a tiny little collection of cells called the beta cells. And if those beta cells can no longer secrete insulin, you've got a system-wide defect and you have to inject insulin from the outside world. If you don't, you die, period, end of story. So Robbie discovered that when he was a young kid. Uh, I discovered that when I was 22, which admittedly is very late. So not only was I diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, I was diagnosed with two other autoimmune conditions. The first one is called Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, reduction in thyroid hormone output. Uh, number two is alopecia universalis, which is why I have no hair. So alopecia just means hair loss. Universalis means everywhere. So I have no eyebrows. I have no eyelashes. I have no nose hair. I have no ear hair. I have nothing on me. And then the third autoimmune condition is type 1 diabetes. And all three of them set in within a six-month period. And so, uh, you know, at the age of 22, I'm trying to graduate college. I'm going to Stanford University. And I'm, I'm scared because all of a sudden I, you know, go from being a happy-go-lucky guy who's trying to get a job in the outside world to a medical patient three times over. Yeah. So at this point, uh, you know, I'm open to learning anything that's going to help me from feeling crappy and from having my blood glucose go through the roof. Because if you've never lived with, you know, a blood glucose problem, pat yourself on the back. If you have blood glucose sort of instability issues, when your blood glucose goes high, you feel like crap. When your blood glucose goes low, you feel like crap. When your blood glucose is within a normal range and it stays there, you feel much better. So on a daily basis, my blood glucose is going high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. And, you know, you're trying to develop some type of system whereby you know how much insulin to give yourself for every meal and at what time of the day. And it depends on what you're eating and it depends on how much you're exercising. So it's this multivariable equation that's got a bunch of moving parts. And your goal is to just try and keep your blood glucose within a normal range. And admittedly, it's very challenging. So the doctors at this time of my life were saying, you know, low carbohydrate diet, low carbohydrate diet, low carbohydrate diet. And they still do that to this day. And the idea behind a low carbohydrate diet is that if you're living with diabetes and you consume carbohydrate rich foods like bananas or fruits or potatoes or quinoa or beans and lentils, as an example, any of those foods that contain a sufficient amount of carbohydrate energy means that you're going to inject more insulin. 
So the idea is simple. It's like, okay, if you're trying to control your blood glucose, a simple way to do it is to minimize your insulin use. And a simple way to do that is to eat less carbohydrate rich foods. So it seemed pretty logical to me at the beginning. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do this. So I got, uh, a, I got a prescription to eat more meat, more cheese, more eggs, yeah. more bacon, yeah. more chicken, more tuna. And I was like, great, this is literally the diet that I love to eat. Great. I'm going to do it. So <laughs> I, I would wake up in the morning and I would, uh, I would fry two turkey burgers for breakfast. And wow. then I would have a, you know, an egg to go along with that. Yeah. And then at lunchtime, I would have a sandwich that's like mainly vegetables with some black forest ham and some really thin bread. And then for dinner, I would pig out on a giant piece of cod with, uh, you know, a side of non-starchy vegetables. So I was trying to do my best to follow this low carbohydrate prescription, mm-hmm. but like I said, my blood glucose was all, all over the place, all mm-hmm. over the place. Mm-hmm. And I felt terrible, mm-hmm. I felt terrible, uh, low energy. I, uh, I had a very difficult time exercising. I had a very difficult time recovering from exercise. Yeah. And after doing this for about a year, I said to myself, you know what? Intuitively, I know something is wrong. I yeah. know it because I just don't feel right. Yeah. And my energy levels are going lower and lower and lower. And I actually suffered from like what I consider to be muscular inflammation. Yeah. So as opposed to joint inflammation, which happens in either osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or gout, uh, muscle inflammation is, from my experience, when you go and you perform exercise, and then instead of recovering within a 24 to 48 hour period, it takes you four days, five days, six days a week. I'd go and I'd play a game of soccer and I would lay on the couch for four days. And that had never been true up until that point. So I switched over. I started eating a low fat plant-based whole food diet under the guidance of a nutrition expert who basically said, Cyrus, trust me, what you're about to experience is awesome. So he showed me a system whereby I could increase my fruit intake, significantly (laughs) increase my fruit intake, but I had to do it at the expense of fat rich and protein rich foods. And that was the key, right? So he said, all right, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to open your mind to the idea that you can eat lots of bananas and figs and dates and berries and melons and mangoes and papayas until you pass out. And you're not going to use a single unit more of insulin. And I said to him, I don't believe you. And he was like, of course you don't believe me because you have been subscribing to the carbohydrate means more insulin methodology. I don't expect you to believe me. Just try it. So in the first week, I started eating just like he described, lots and lots of fruits and lots of vegetables. And I completely cut out meat, fish, dairy, oil, eggs, gone, which was a hard thing for me to do. But I said, you know what, I'll try it out. And because I eliminated those foods, the fat content of my diet fell, the protein content of my diet fell. As a result of those two falling, my ability to consume and metabolize carbohydrates went through the roof. So my insulin use, I was expecting it. Okay, you know, I'm now eating 600 grams of carbohydrate per day. Okay, great. <laughs> that means if I six-tuple my carbohydrate intake, then I'm going to six-tuple my insulin use. Wrong. My insulin use came down by 40%. So I'm eating effectively six times as many grams of carbohydrate per day, and I'm using almost half as much insulin. So at that point, I was like, oh, wait a minute. A couple of things are true. Number one. This idea that eating more carbohydrates equals more insulin is totally bogus. It's not true. And then number two, there's something fascinating going on under the surface, and I want to learn more. So long story short, I put myself back to school. I went to UC Berkeley to go get a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, because I was like, you know what? I want to learn. I want to be able to talk about this in a scientific Mm. way rather than just sort of using, citing biology that may or may not be true. So I went to UC Berkeley for five years to study uh, nutritional biochemistry, which is basically just super nerd nutrition, <laughs> to really understand the molecular level details of what's happening in your pancreas and your brain, your thyroid gland, your blood and your muscle tissue. And having walked away from that five-year experience, it was almost like I was privy to a whole collection of information of you know, what the research community has known for over a hundred years, which is that a type two diabetes is reversible in more than 80% of all cases. Okay. That's very important to understand. Number two, you can reverse prediabetes and type two diabetes by 
dropping your fat and protein intake and increasing your carbohydrate intake. That's the way you do it. Okay. Number three, carbohydrates are not your enemy. They never were the enemy. They never will be the enemy. And anybody who tells you that carbohydrate rich foods are the enemy doesn't understand science properly. And having gone through this experience where I was now maximizing my insulin sensitivity, I, I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a way where I can help other people. Mm -hmm. Started working with clients individually that then became small group, at which point Robbie and I joined forces. And now uh, we have created a large group coaching program that now serves hundreds of people. We have, you know, currently 800 plus people in our coaching program. And by the end of the year, we're hoping to have about 2000 people in our coaching program. And, you know, the story that Robbie is telling you, the story that I'm telling you, which is that you eat more carbohydrate rich foods for yeah. less insulin and less medication. It's true in, oh, I don't know, 95% or more of all the people who work. And so it's a really, it's a really, really, really fun job. And it's cool to watch people of all different shapes and sizes and disease history for the first time, be able to see such improvement in their overall health, drop their oral medications, lose weight, get off blood pressure medications, get off high cholesterol medications and start to like live for the first time in many years. That, that's a fabulous story, man. Not just the personal side of it, but the educational side of it and so on. And, um, you know, I love how you just went out and just decided to research the heck out of it, which I did informally when I got sick because I have a, you know, laser physics background. And although I've done stand up comedy between laser physics and getting sick, uh, I decided to go back and just, you know, buy every book I could on digestion, enzymes, hydrochloric acid, arthritis and, and, and so on. So I did it informally. You've gone back and done a PhD in it, which I think is tremendous. And so what I want to do now is just actually uh, let's break down the myths then of what's going on. You know, you've, you've gone and studied this and we might hand back to Robbie and, and get him maybe to, to explain this, to balance things out. Um, what, what's wrong with this at, at an atomic level? Why, why do we have to have low fat, for example? What's going on here? Okay, so I'm going to give you a very basic answer and I'm going to turn it back over to Cyrus to give you a more scientific answer. So, okay. you know, look, when I'm talking on my own, I give a certain answer. When I got Cyrus here with me, we go into the, the nitty gritty. So the, the basic, basic thing is that the reason a low fat diet is important is because the underlying problem or challenge with all forms of diabetes is insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is the cause of type two diabetes and the cause of prediabetes for people living with type one diabetes. You can also be living with insulin resistance, which makes it much more challenging to manage your blood glucose, keep your blood glucose in range, like Cyrus was talking about, but also it leads to increased chances of all the complications that are associated with type 1 diabetes. So all people living with diabetes, the number one killer is heart disease. They're not dying of high blood glucose numbers. They're dying of these other diseases, mainly heart disease. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, and so what is insulin resistance? So that is caused by fat stored in tissues that are not designed to store fat. So that's the, the basic summary. I'll let Cyrus go into more about the muscle, the liver, and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let me tell a quick story here. That was a great preface here. Um, when you eat, so regardless of whether you're living with diabetes or not, let's just say Clint in your situation, right? You're non-diabetic. You're a healthy guy. Okay. If you start eating a diet that contains foods that are high in fat and or protein, okay, and it turns out that fat and protein tend to travel together in foods, okay, so whether those foods are things like chicken and beef and eggs, or whether they're foods like avocados and olive oil and lots of nuts and seeds, okay, regardless, if you're eating a diet that's higher in fat and higher in protein, what ends up happening is that uh, mainly the fat. Uh, comes in your mouth, it travels down your esophagus, it gets into your stomach, and then from that point, it gets into your blood, okay? It goes through your small intestine into your blood, and now you have fatty acids that are, that are circulating in your blood, and the fatty acids end up getting deposited inside of your muscle and your liver in particular, okay? They're two very large stores house of energy, and fatty acids can basically gain entrance to both of those tissues for free. The cellular mechanisms that prevent fatty acids from accumulating in those tissues are very poor. They're very weak. And so as a result of that, the more fat you eat, the more fat ends up inside of those tissues. Also, fat ends up inside of your adipose tissue or your fat tissue. 
And your fat tissue is kind of, you know, it's located in your neck, it's in your face, it's in your abdomen, it's in your butt, it's everywhere. So fat basically gets partitioned to these three different tissues. Okay. So over the course of time, as you continue to eat a high fat and high protein diet, you get more lipid or more fat deposition inside of your muscle, more inside of your liver, more in your muscle, more in your liver, more in your muscle, more in your liver. And at a certain point, when those tissues have accumulated an excess amount of fatty acids, they go into a state called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, just think of it as like a protective mechanism. What they're trying to do is they're trying to block more energy from coming inside of the tissue because fatty acids are very rich in energy. The problem is that they can't really block fatty acids because like I told you earlier, the mechanisms to block fatty acids from entering the tissues are pretty weak. So as a result of that, they go, okay, I'm going to try and block energy. The, The most effective way that I can block energy is to tell insulin to go away. (laughs) Now, the reason is because insulin is the most powerful anabolic hormone in your body. And what that means is that when insulin is present, insulin, what it does is it basically tells tissues, it knocks on the door and says, hey, muscle, hey, liver, I have this glucose. This is your opportunity to take it up. Go. So when insulin is present, then those tissues can then open their doors and let glucose come inside. So if the muscle and liver basically tell insulin to go away, the next time insulin knocks on the door and says, hey, knock, knock, I got some glucose, the muscle and liver are sort of like, "Mm -mm, not listening, don't pay attention, don't pay attention, don't pay attention. And by doing that, they basically prevent more glucose and more energy from coming inside the tissue. So they're, they're effectively blocking more energy from coming in, right? So here's the problem. At that point in that state, if you go and eat a banana, you go eat a bowl of quinoa, you have some beans, The glucose, the the carbohydrate energy from that food will get broken down into glucose. Glucose will enter your blood. Your pancreas will secrete insulin. So now you have insulin and glucose together. The insulin will come and knock on the door, say, hey, knock, knock, liver, muscle. I got some glucose. You want to take it up? And those, uh, those tissues are basically like, hey, insulin, sorry. Do you see what I have inside of me right now? I'm, I'm done. We're, we're, we're close for business. You go do something else. So insulin doesn't really work as well. Insulin gets trapped in your blood. Glucose can't get out of your blood, so glucose gets trapped in your blood. And as a result of that, you use a blood glucose meter, you check your blood glucose, you look at it, and the number is high. And you say, oh, look, that doesn't make any sense. I ate a banana, now my blood glucose is high. It must be the banana's fault, right? So that's what happens in the world of diabetes is people are constantly blaming the banana and they're blaming the potatoes. Because every time I eat those foods, my blood glucose goes high. But the, the problem, just like Robbie was saying, is that insulin resistance is the problem. Okay, If you get rid of insulin resistance and allow those tissues to act as a giant net, such that when you do go eat a banana or you do go eat a, a potato, then the glucose from those foods can enter the tissues. Then you can eat a very large quantity of those foods and your blood glucose stays nice and rock solid. So insulin resistance is, like Robbie said, the cause of prediabetes. It is the cause of type 2 diabetes. In other words, you cannot become type 2, you cannot become prediabetic unless you have insulin resistance. Right. It is a, it's a cause and effect relationship. With people with type 1, what ends up happening is they develop type 1 through an autoimmune reaction that is not their fault. It happens due to environmental conditions. Maybe there's a virus that you contracted. Maybe it's something to do with the cow's milk protein that you've been eating from a young age. So you end up with an autoimmune condition. At that point, your doctor says, oh, eat a low carbohydrate diet. You start eating a low carbohydrate diet, and then you actually eat yourself into type 2 diabetes. So you end up with type 1, and then you eat yourself into type 2, and you have what's called double diabetes. And that's a huge problem. Because now you're living with insulin resistance and you don't make insulin. Now you got to use a ton of insulin from the outside world. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. And it, it comes at me a little easier because we have been over this in person. Uh, we've talked about this and I have read Neil Bernard's Reversing Diabetes, which is uh, a fabulous, fabulous book, which, it, which is a similar sort of um, explanation that you just gave yours was you know just as uh, rich and different in its own way um, but I remember the the discussion that that he put forward or the explanation which was that um, you know, insulin is like the key to unlock the cell to provide the sugar to go in 
But when you've got insulin resistance, uh, the, the cell cannot be unlocked. And so the sugar cannot get into the cell and just keep circulating. So it's the same, just a different metaphor. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Okay, good. So let's say, let's, let's imagine someone is sitting here on the edge of their seat saying, my God, this is what I've needed to know. So, but how do they make that transition that you made, Cyrus, where you've, you've gone from a high fat sort of conventional wisdom, but you need to get to the, the holy grail outcome, which is to be living with the condition and having wonderful life as if it's just a small inconvenience like you guys. That week or two must be crucial how you transition across. And maybe it goes a bit beyond the scope of, of this call, but what's the general, how do you get that balance right? Maybe, uh, Robbie, you might want to take that one up or... Sure. I mean, so it, for, it's very nuanced and it's something we're very proud of in our coaching program is that we work with people on the day to day nuanced details. So it's going to be different for each person. Now, we're not just writing ebooks and making videos and go do it yourself. Like we are there in the nitty gritty and we love to work with people through that challenge, that, that transition. So but the general guideline is that one thing we do is we guide people through changing one meal at a time. And even when doing one meal at a time, they see improvements in their blood glucose numbers, even if they just change their breakfast. And sometimes we do see challenging cases where, you know what, they're changing one meal at a time and it's not enough. And numbers maybe got worse because they're eating really you know, terrible stuff at uh, lunch and dinner and they already have a very fatty liver and it's a big problem. So in that case, that's when we guide them through, okay, hey, wait a minute, we gotta go a little bit deeper right away. And we got to, you know, work hard and do this together. And that's where we start making the adjustments of adding in more uh, non-starchy vegetables in the transition phase. And so sort of the glycemic index becomes useful in that point, basically, in that stage, essentially. So more beans, more non-starchy vegetables. And it's not saying you can't have any fruit or you don't have any grapes. It's more about if you're going to eat grapes, make sure to eat them in a salad with a bunch of other you know, vegetables and greens, and that, that, that meal now has a different glycemic impact on your blood glucose. hundred percent. Cause it's the yeah. net, it's the sum total of the foods glycemic index that gives you the meals glycemic index, doesn't it? Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is awesome. All right. So now, um, I imagine there is a graduation process that people go through. Um, you, we've just been speaking now about that first few weeks that you guide people with. What's the end goal? Where are people aiming for? And it may differ depending on which type they have. But I mean, what's the, uh, you know, I have five phases in my program, preparation, cleanse, baseline or elimination. And then it is reintroduction of foods. And then finally a maintenance phase, which is where I just, and I have a completely diverse, low fat plant-based diet. What's the end goal for you guys? Where are you getting people to? Okay, that's a great question. So I would say the end goal, it kind of, let's, let's put it this way. The end goal, which can actually be somewhat difficult to measure, admittedly, is to get your insulin use to what is considered a physiologically normal insulin use. So let me explain what that means. Clint, um, you have a functioning pancreas. Your, the beta cells in your pancreas manufacture insulin every single time you eat food. And in fact, they're manufacturing insulin and sort of drip irrigating that into your blood all day long, every single day in order to keep your glucose nice and stable. So if we were to do a, an experiment on you to try and find out how many units of insulin your pancreas is producing on a daily basis, we would come up with a number. And that number would be relatively stable from day to day because I know how you eat. You're very consistent in the foods that you put in your mouth. And as a result of that, your insulin output is also nice and stable. Okay. So your physiologically normal amount of insulin is the amount of insulin that your pancreas would produce if you were living a you know, low-fat, plant-based, whole food lifestyle, whereby your risk for chronic disease is nice and low. So it's you know, considered your quote-unquote healthy, normal physiological amount of insulin. Okay? So if you're living with type 1 diabetes like Ravi and myself, most people come into our program living with type 1 diabetes where they're injecting a lot of insulin. And again, they're injecting a lot of insulin because they're insulin resistant. So they come into our program and they're injecting, let's call it 40, 45, 50, 60 units of insulin per day, when in reality, their physiologically normal target is closer to 25 to 30 units of insulin per day. 
So what we'll do is we'll teach them over the course of time how transitioning their diet on a stepwise basis brings their insulin use down and down and down and down and down. And you would think, okay, well, this is the biological system. It's going to take a long time to get from 60 units all the way down to 30 units. That's a 50% reduction. But what we generally see is that people will end up dropping their insulin use pretty quickly right off the bat. So it's not atypical to get something like a 20% reduction in insulin use in the first week. Like I said earlier, I dropped my insulin use by 40% in one week, in one week, right? And so people usually make a big drop and then they make stepwise drops and drops and drops and drops until they get to their physiologically normal value. For someone who's not injecting insulin, you can't measure how much insulin your pancreas is producing. So in that situation, we use indirect measures. And the indirect measures are number one, are you at your ideal body weight? Okay. We give you a calculator that says, based off of your height, based off of your sex, this is your ideal body weight. Only when you get to this body weight is your actual insulin sensitivity maximized. If you're anything above this body weight, you are de facto more and more insulin resistant. So as an example, if your target body weight is 175 pounds and you're 210 pounds, then that extra 35 pounds is adding more insulin resistance onto tissues. So, you know, you start at 210, you drop, you drop, you drop, you get to about 175 pounds. At that point, that's indicator number one, that you're producing the physiologically normal amount of insulin. Number two, if you're taking any other oral medications, let's say you're taking high blood pressure medication, you're taking high cholesterol medication, okay? Those medications, your need is going to go down over time as your body weight comes down and as your insulin sensitivity Mm -hmm. goes up. So medication use tends to drop. Energy levels go through the roof. And then when somebody goes back to their doctor to get their A1C value measured, which is their, you know, their marker of average blood glucose over the past three months, your A1C has a very specific range that you're trying to achieve. Okay? In order to be classified as non-diabetic, it has to be 5.7 or below. Right. In order to be classified as pre-diabetic, it's basically 5.7 to 6.4. And then anything beyond 6.4 means you have type 2 diabetes. So let's say you start with an A1C value of eight, which is not uncommon. We want to get your A1C from eight down to seven, down to six, down to below 5.7. If we can do that, normalize your body weight, get you off medications, and then also lastly, make sure that you're active on a daily basis, then chances are your pancreas is secreting the physiologically normal amount of insulin. And then you're good to go, continue the lifestyle, and it'll continue for the end of time. It's amazing, isn't it? It's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, and, and I just want yeah. to bring it back to one important point Cyrus was talking about. And really, one of the big things we do at Master Diabetes, we reverse insulin resistance, all forms of diabetes. And Cyrus talks about this often in his lectures of insulin resistance being linked to so many other conditions. So I don't know if Cyrus, you want to talk about that long list, but I know you have that whole wheel on your slides. Sure. Yeah. So real briefly, insulin resistance is a, is a central node. Okay. So think about it as like the center of a wheel. And on the outside of that wheel, you have practically every other chronic disease that you can think of, right. whether it's high cholesterol, hypertension, uh, like we said, pre, uh, type 2 diabetes, cancer, erectile dysfunction, atherosclerosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, yada, yada, yada. You can keep going all the way around this wheel. Point being is that if you target the root cause of uh, metabolic damage and cellular dysfunction, which is insulin resistance, you bring that down and you become insulin sensitive, then the symptoms of all these other conditions also tend to go away. You know, we've had people come into our program with rheumatoid arthritis within two months, their rheumatoid arthritis is gone. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. We've had people come in with osteoarthritis, gone, high blood pressure, gone, coronary artery disease, gone, you're right, cognitive decline, gone, right? So these are all very important metrics of overall health that are directly linked to insulin resistance. Yeah, it's, it's similar in what I witness as well, whereas instead of targeting insulin resistance, we target um, the restoration of the digestive system. And that's yeah. what we've got in our mind is when we're trying to achieve this. And the reason that we are targeting low fat is because fat increases intestinal permeability. And when we're having an increased intestinal permeability, then we're getting more of the problematic proteins entering the bloodstream 
which is then causing the uh, immune system, which has got this innocent confusion to attack the joints when it sees these problematic proteins, to kick into gear. And so by targeting healing the gut, which reduces the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, we also see all those other things that you, now I, I can't claim to have seen all of those other things reduced because I you know, have not seen some of those in, in clients, but certainly common other problems like gout or tiredness or you know, the type 2 diabetes is a classic example relevant to what we're talking about, um, uh, also to resolve. So what's fundamental, again, uh, between both of our approaches is that it's all plants, it's low in fat, and that it's whole foods. And it's whether or not you're targeting healing the gut or targeting insulin resistance, you get these phenomenal life-changing improvements across the entire spectrum. And that's why it's like just ridiculously awesome. And, and you feel, you know, and you feel very passionate and excited about talking about it because it's not like we're onto some fad here or this is some kind of latest thing. This is like true health because nature is providing the healing. 100%. There's this phrase that one of the doctors that we know, Dr. Gibson, he says, he says, you can't heal your body selectively. You can't do it. Right. And you can say, oh, I'm going to eat this way because I'm going to try and reverse diabetes. And that could easily happen. But in the process, you're also going to improve your digestive status. You're probably going to improve your ability to think. You're probably going to completely transform your microbiome. You're probably going to become, have a lot more energy, et cetera, et cetera. So all these you know, processes unfold and you can't, you can't sit there and choose one of them because they're all going to happen likely at the same time. I got one question for you before we wrap up. Both you guys are physically fit. Cyrus, looks like you try and maintain like a, a, a body that'll impress your woman for the rest of your life. Um, uh, okay, now, now, but I noticed both you guys eat a lot of fruit. Now, when I was uh, in my raw food days, so I went through a period where I only ate raw plant food. So, you know, nothing cooked whatsoever. Uh, and most of my calories came from soaked raw almonds and soaked raw macadamias and soaked pumpkin seeds and stuff. I just, no matter what I did, I couldn't gain my weight back that I lost by doing so. And no matter how many calories, I would count calories and sometimes go into the 4,000 some days, but I still couldn't gain weight when I was trying to work out and stuff. Um, now, both of you, I'd like answers on this. Um, with a lot of fruit intake, how do you keep the muscles and strength on? Or is it, have I fallen into the same stupid trap that many people do? But what am I missing? There must be, the, what's going on there? Okay, I'm going to let Cyrus answer that muscle part because he's yeah. the ripped one here. But I just want to also just make it clear, um, the, you are describing what would be called a high-fat raw food diet. Okay, yep. So it's completely different than the type of you know, fruit-based approach that some people on our program could follow. A Master Debbie's program is not a raw food program. It's not an only fruit program, obviously. But if somebody wanted to do a raw food diet appropriately, they would have a very minimal amount of nuts. So we at Master Diabetes define a low-fat diet as a maximum of 15% of calories coming from fat or in, um, in a general guideline is no more than 30 grams of total fat. So mm -hmm. that's so you're eating all those nuts and seeds, you're automatically going above that. So you know when we do it, we, we're getting our calories from whole fruits, yep. not very minimal nuts and seeds. So I'll let Cyrus answer the muscle part. Yeah, and sorry, before Cyrus jumps in, I wasn't suggesting that that was the diet. That's just something I tried and failed, even when I was eating a lot of fat. I just couldn't, couldn't get there. And I thought, you know, getting it, maybe, we, you know, it's un unnecessary depth on this. But what I noticed is when I would then eat dry roasted nuts versus soaked raw nuts, I was able to get much more traction with my weight gain. Uh, but of course, dry roasted nuts are much more advanced when you're trying to heal something like rheumatoid than the soaked raw nuts because they are activated and the, the, fatty acid, the fats become fatty acids and so on. It's all getting complicated. But what I want to know, basically, how are you ripped, Cyrus? How do you do it? <laughs> okay, thanks for the question. So when I, I'll, full disclosure, when I first became a vegan back in 2002 or a plant-based eater, uh, I also was raw because the, the guru that I was learning from at the time, he, he basically is a raw food, you know, instructor. So that's what I did. It worked like a charm. So for 14 years, I was eating nothing but 
raw fruits and vegetables all day long. And I felt fantastic and I, and I got no complaints with it. And what ended up happening was that somewhere along the way, I decided that I wanted to eat more potatoes and more squash and more beans and more lentils. So by choice, I decided that I'm going to start eating a little bit more cooked food. And so my diet right now consists of primarily raw with a little bit of cooked here and there. Okay. But in that process of eating a raw food diet, I noticed the exact same thing that you noticed, Clint, which is that no matter how much I ate, no matter how many bananas, how many mangoes, how many you know pieces of papaya I put in my body, I could not gain weight. I could not, uh, I was having a difficult time maintaining my weight. And it was frustrating me because I was like, this whole, you know, energy in, energy out equation just doesn't seem to be working, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So when I analyzed my diet, what I noticed was that my protein intake on a raw food diet was actually something like, you know, six to seven to eight percent of total calories. Mm -hmm. And like what Robbie was saying is that, you know, what we try and teach people to do is eat a maximum of 15 percent. And so I said to myself, listen, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to see if I if I if protein really is that important which a lot of people will tell you is the truth. What if I started eating something like a protein supplement? So I went and I did a whole bunch of research and I found that hemp could be a good alternative. So I literally bought a hemp protein powder at the store and I started incorporating that into my diet. By doing so, my protein intake went from like six to 7% of my total calories, upwards of like 10, 11, 12, 13, sometimes close to 15%. So I effectively doubled my protein intake. By doing that, boom, I noticed immediately that my, I was getting a lot more bang for my buck. Like I would still go out and I would exercise. I would do a lot of resistance-based movements. I would go to the gym. I would work out. And instead of feeling like I couldn't weight maintain, all of a sudden, boom, I was building shoulders. I was building triceps. I was building abs. I was building a chest. And so by changing my protein intake and increasing that proportion of total calories that came from protein, that's where I got the effect. So if, if you choose to be a raw foodie, which I, again, completely advocate, think about what's your total proportion of calories from protein. If it's down beneath 10%, I would suggest increasing it to between 10 and 15%. And again, you can do it through some kind of hemp-based protein powder would be right. my recommendation. But if you're eating a cooked food diet, it's actually e easier to meet that 10 to 15% requirement because by eating cooked food, you can eat beans, you can eat lentils, you can eat quinoa. And, and just by incorporating those three foods into your diet, your protein content will go up. And so if you choose to be a cooked food vegan, just eat more beans, eat more lentils, eat more quinoa, boom, you're there and it, you should be able to not only gain mass, but keep that mass on for a long period of time. Yeah, beautiful. Um, well, sounds like I found out what was going wrong during the raw food days. And, um, and now, um, you know, my diet consists of lots of lentils, lots of beans um, with uh, rice is most often the base behind those kind of meals. Um, obviously, quinoa here and there, and quinoa is a very big portion of, our, of the early parts of, of our program. So people are getting lots of Lots of protein in, in that format, that cooked format, and I've covered that off a lot in other episodes. So that's, uh, yeah, awesome, boys. Well, this has been sensational. So um, what, who's the sort of clientele that uh, that's most benefits from your program um, and where should they go to learn more about it? Okay, so the, the you know, whether you're living, it doesn't matter what type of diabetes you have. You could be living with type 1, type 1 and a half, which is adult onset type 1. Um, pre-diabetes type two diabetes. If you have any type of diabetes there, uh, visit www.masteringdiabetes.org. Okay. And that's your starting point. If you go into the nav bar, you can click on coaching and you can learn about our process in our process. We provide you with an online course that teaches you exactly what to do. We give you a Facebook community. That's very strong that enables you to share your experience and learn from other people. And then uh, every twice per month, we have uh, large group video conferences where you can bring your specific concerns to us and we can work with you uh, in a large group format. We also have small group coaching where we give you more of a much, uh, a much closer focus. And we also have private coaching as well. So depending on the level of attention that you need and how much direct access you want to Robbie and I, there's multiple options. So if that's something that you know anybody from your audience is interested in participating in, uh, go learn about it. 
and uh, see if it's the right thing for you. Because, you know, we get a tremendously high success rate, something between 85 and 93 percent success. And it's really a fun, fun process. And I just want to add that um, for any of our programs that you sign up for, whether it's a large group, a small group or the private, anyone, we our Facebook group our is so powerful and we answer questions within 24 hours. That's our key that we are there with you every step of the way. So we talked about earlier, somebody comes in the program, there's they, maybe they're concerned in that transition phase or seeing high bug goes, they don't know what to do. Like we are going to be with you every single step of the way every day. However often you want to ask questions, 365 days a year. We are just so passionate about this. We love it. We just want nothing more than people to succeed and, and get the results that we know they can if they apply the program properly and, and know what to do. Yeah, nothing beats having someone to guide you who's been through it or is living it themselves. And that's why you guys offer something that is so unique to people with diabetes because rewind 10 years and it's a wasteland. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to learn. It's just confusing information online. And in fact, even to this day, you know, I made a comment on uh, on a YouTube video the other day. There's someone who's done a TED talk and this particular female speaker has like, I guess like, I forget, but, but you know, upwards of 500,000 video views. And it's all the the information that you discredited at the start of this conversation. And everyone underneath is like, this is, this should be like, you know, taught in schools and everything. And it's like, no, it's the absolute wrong stuff. You know what I mean? And so finding, you guys are like the narrow path through the mountain for people with diabetes. And again, to draw parallels to what, what I do, anyone who's familiar with how I operate, what I teach and so forth, uh, you've got uh, a, a, an outstanding comparable platform to work with these guys over at uh, Mastering Diabetes. So thank you so much, guys. And I look forward to uh, continuing uh, staying in touch with you guys for a long time. Uh, love your energy. Love what you're doing. Thanks so much for coming on this uh, episode. Thank you, Clint. We really appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, you're, you're transforming lives just like us. And uh, we hope that over the course of time, you can increase your exposure, you can increase the number of clients that you work with, and we're doing the exact same thing. I echo everything Cyrus said. Thank you so much. Good on you guys.